Thank you for um, spending your Friday night with us. I'm Jen Bradvich. I'm our director of exhibitions and programs here at Print Center New York. And I have the honor of moderating this conversation tonight, Vision and Grit, Forging Paths for Women Printer Publishers with Marina Kukonek, Pat Macraccio, Leslie Duca, and Judith Salaka. And we're here, oh yeah, let's do that. So we're here on the occasion of uh, this exhibition, a model workshop, Margaret Lohengren and the Contemporaries, which was curated by uh, Lauren Rosenblum and Christina Wilde. The project is the first to examine the work of Lohengren, who founded the hybrid workshop gallery of the Contemporaries in 1951, and in doing so was, we think, the first woman to create a space like this in the US. Our curators argue that the Contemporaries was a vibrant site for artistic experimentation and innovation in the field of printmaking, especially in lithography, during a decade that is typically considered to be a fallow period in, museum, uh, in the medium's history. And, they argue, Lohengrin should be understood as a disruptor of the print field in her own time, Someone whose vision for the artistic revival of printmaking in the US and for establishing a model of collaboration, education, and access was a prescient one and would have lasting impact on the field. We all know about the print boom of the 1960s, but low and ground, uh, we believe, should be placed firmly in the line of other women who belong in that conversation, like June Wayne, who founded Tamarind Lithography Workshop and Tatiana Grossman, who founded the LA East. And in fact, she pioneered her model and influenced these others, founding her workshop in 1951 and building the essential scaffolding for a printmaking ecosystem that would explode the following decade. So with Margaret's tenacity in mind, we wanted to hold this conversation to think about how in the 70 years since her work, uh, that path-breaking legacy continues up to our present. And so, in thinking about that legacy, if you'll bear with me, I just want to spend a moment to set a post Margaret scene. And in thinking about this this week and preparing for this panel, I am indebted to a fantastic presentation by Christine Adams, who is a Tamron trained lithographer. And who presented a research project at a conference held at Tamron in 2019. Uh, Her talk was called The Long View Women in Tamron, the Tamron Workshop, and Their Continued Impact. And in it, she traced the lineage of women printers trained at Tamron uh, by combining data about their master printer training program and uh, research that she conducted in their archives with entries that she did. And what she found was really interesting, and it's on YouTube and you should watch it. It's about 35 minutes, so very good. Um, what she found was that, uh, for example, in 1965, 46 men and nine women applied to the no women were admitted. In rejection letters, she discovered that Tamron rejected women like the applicant Maya Jacklich, like this, quote, Tamron printer grantees go through intensive training with a view toward entering a free enterprise. As far as feasible, we try to simulate conditions they would encounter in a professional shop, printing for other artists. It is physically too demanding for all. <laughs> There's a lot to look at. <laughs> For one year in the program, a ledger of applicants indicates only one woman applied, and a penciled in note next to her name said, Reject female. <laughs> Adams found that June Wayne, in her own correspondence, admitted that she rejected the idea of being master printers based on, quote, physical incapacity. But Adams also posits that it was Wayne's preoccupation about how to create a lasting and sustainable workshop that led her to prefer men. This is the way it had been done, this is what she had been seeing. And to paraphrase Adams, Wayne wasn't looking to rock the boat. She simply really wanted this place to succeed. But women interested in the Master Printer Training Program were directed to the Curatorial Training Program instead, which was considered more appropriate for them. Until the 70s. And Adams highlights that changes to discrimination and labor laws, along with Tamron's new affiliation with the University of New Mexico, may help change the tide for the institution. 
The first woman, Christine Kay, was accepted into their program in 1971, although she wouldn't complete it. And that would be someone else. I'll tell you who in a second. <laughs> Adams collected all the program demographic data and found it. She found that from about 2000 to 2019, 60% or so of printers who went through the program now identified as women or non binary. So, Adams' project is an important one because although it only looks at one institution's program, it helps us understand a glimpse into where the field has been and how it may change, have changed. How training as a master printmaker and going on to work in the field in today's world is tremendously different from those who've come over us. And so before we begin here with our amazing panelists, um, I just want to acknowledge that it would take a very big stage to include every woman master printmaker, um, every woman publisher, every woman print entrepreneur, print entrepreneur, who uh, has gotten the field to where it is today. And I know we probably have some of these people in the audience, and just by show of hands, who here identifies as a woman printmaker, woman print publisher, woman <laughs> Good, and, uh, and is anybody, has anyone been doing it since like around 2000, when we saw this change in the dates of Tamar, in the demographics of Tamar? Anybody been doing it since like the 80s or so? All right, good. More claps, I think. <laughs> So with so many printers here tonight, I know that uh, we have many folks who will help us kind of enrich and uh, extend our conversation. So I will leave questions for the end, and I hope some of you will kind of jump in with some thoughts or your own experiences to um, contribute. Um, so just in case folks don't know who is who here, Marina and Kasha uh, on the end. Open 10 Grand Press in 1999 in Brooklyn and has expanded operations since now working out of Brooklyn and Santa Fe. She's known for her dedication to experimentation and process, often incorporating innovative techniques or materials and resulting in variable additions. Kathy Caraccio is a Brooklyn-born master printer. A master printer, artist, curator, and collector who trained with Blackburn, among others, and opened the Caraccio Studio in 1977. In the nearly 50 years since, 50 years? Yeah, it says. She's worked with hundreds of artists around the world and nurtured a large community around her studio. In 2017, Leslie Duguid founded Duguid <laughs> the first black female owned fine art screen printing business in New York. Great. <laughs> Which now operates on the new storefront in Bed Stuy. <laughs> Currently, do good produces editions for exhibiting Arts of 52 Walker, an extension of David's Murder Gallery. Judith Salakin is a legend. Judith <laughs> was. <laughs> Judith was the first woman to graduate from Tamron's Master Lithographer Program in 1957. She founded her own. I'm sorry, 75. I just aged you. <laughs> I just aged you so much. Uh, she founded her own shop solo impression of Palmer Frank in her hometown of New York and has worked doggedly as a publisher and printer ever since. She is also a milliner, which you may have noticed from her. I think between the four of them, we have at least 120 years of printing experience on stage. So I really want to get a um, conversation going tonight. And, and to kick us off, I thought uh, if you, it would be good to kind of hear um, a brief overview about each of your paths, and to kind of give that a little shape, um, my question is, the panel's title is Vision and Grid, um, which takes its name from uh, an essay in the catalog for the show. Um, when you hear that phrase, how do you think about this in terms of your own career? In other words, what did you set out to achieve? What was that vision? What lit the fire underneath you? And what challenges did you face? What was the grit? you demonstrated to get to where you are today. Um, maybe, Judith, do you want to start us off? We can have the honors. Uh, since I have a longevity, um, uh, the grid is still with me, not only in the printing of uh, stones, where you use grit, and so you physically have to engage with the stone. Uh, presently, I don't have any lithography stones. 
I've donated them all to Pratt Institute, where I teach. Um, and I also teach at the School of Visual Arts to continue uh, young people um, being exposed to what I think of as the most elegant, um, rich process. And uh, the vision is that I love lithography. I love the quality of the ink on paper. I love working with the artists and the collaboration. Um, I learned to become a businesswoman um, and to set up my own shop and to hopefully make a profit. Um, I don't work with an institution which uh, would have um, been an umbrella for me um, in case of hard times. Um, I've had to go through them all myself. But as the name of my shop indicates, it's called Solo. And Solo is from my last name, Salatkin. Uh, but I do like to operate solo. I do like to have an, uh, an impulse, and whether it's economically feasible or not, I become enamored with the artist because it's parallel, basically, to the ideas that I presently have about the work I'm doing. So if I'm working uh, with hats, for example, and feathers, I might have contacted Robert Kushner to incorporate feathers into his prints. So there is a, a dialogue uh, as far as my own artistic interests and the uh, artists that I work with. And, um, and then uh, it's amazing to work with artists and to kind of uh, ride um, on their visions, uh, not only my visions. So um, it's extremely enriching. Kathy, you want to tell us about your vision in grid? Take us back to that. So I renamed yeah. that vision in grid. Yeah. I would stay in one place and work with really them. <laughs> and I uh, went to Hunter College up in the Bronx. Most people don't know it. It was a campus on a residential What's land. And when I was starting there, they decided to make it its own university and they changed it to Herbert H. Newman College, maybe after the former governor of prison in New York State. And they offered the uh, positions for the Hunter uh, faculty to go downtown if they wanted to keep the afternoon. And they all did. And you got a totally new, young father, untrained, just crazy young group of people who talk. And I got to work with an artist. I call him off the road. He came from Peters and Paris. And he, first day, first class, he said, what do you know about this house And they said, we don't know what print making is. What are we doing here? And we did a discussing demonstration. I never attended another class. I stayed with him. I got A grades, even though I was only in the print shop. It was a stairwell cubby hole with one light. It was a janitor's room with the press. And this teacher, revered me like I was an artist. And that was the first time I was an artist because he treated me like an artist. And he wrote told me that all the things around art making, he didn't, he, he didn't, we didn't worry about the grade actually at the end of that first semester. He came to me and he said, um, how do I do grades? And I said, it's the art department, you'll get A's. Being treated as an artist was profoundly changing. And so I followed his whatever advice he gave me. I was always a hard worker. My mother was a seamstress and she gave me my dexterity skills. And so I just moved from my sewing, maybe crocheting, into uh, printmaking, which is a very parallel kind of complex, detail oriented work. And from that little cubby room where you could really concentrate and stay focused and not be distracted and stay late and be through his head. Um, I just knew I was in heaven, this was what I wanted to do, and at the end of my graduation in 1971, he said, go to Black Rooms. What he added to that was, I worked at Black Rooms and I was a master printer for Bob, and they paid me $10 an hour. Mm -hmm. So 1971, the subway was 15 cents, coffee was a dime, it was so $10 an hour, I could, I could earn $10 an hour if I had no vision. 
Clearly, minimum wage was 167 an hour. Thank you. 167 an hour. Minimum yeah, wage. I did that. But I was a waitress and I had off tips and 72 cents an hour. So it, it was the possibilities because it wasn't about money. It was about getting work and meeting people. And Blackburn had a community, international nexus of all different versions of what people did. I would ask them, what work can you do? What's your order? Everybody had a different cultural background. And so instead of doing graduate school, I went to the Blackburn Institute for four years and became a house mother. And by the seat of my pants, did just asked everybody and became you know, part of a community and loved what I did and made. <coughs> Although some people didn't like me because I was also a housekeeping type. <laughs> I hated you that much. You were right for all the other lives. I didn't like that. But um, it, it, isn't, it wasn't vision. I had no vision. I was following my nose. And it wasn't necessarily good. But it is about wanting to work. And it's not. But hard work, it's loving to use your hands and be creative. And that was, a, that was an outcome. Mm -hmm. um, for me, can you hear me? Uh, I would say I always wanted to um, learn while doing. And printmaking was always the thing that once I walked into the shop, I was always amazed at what artists were doing, what was being done, and coming from an artist background family, uh, my father was like, do what you love and you'll, you'll be okay. And I knew the minute I walked into the print shop that I love the space, I love the community, I love the radical aspect of being in the world this way, and I didn't know if I could pull it off, and I still don't know if I can pull it off. But um, for, me, <laughs> for me, it was learning by doing, I would say, and my father's best advice was to blow overhead. And so the two together have kind of enabled me to keep my vision of working with um, women, queer artists, feminists, um, people that normally in the commercial world were not always um, getting the time. And um, so that was also a really strong focus for me to kind of think about the possibilities of being able to do that. And I had always learned in spaces like print shops, I didn't um, have a formal uh, college uh, background with my print education. So I got to learn well doing and I got to meet the printers and the artists and they were really my educators. And through that, I think I was able to really um, see the possibilities. And it took, I think it, it takes for it, kind of what you were saying, it's work. It's, it's work and loving what you do, but it's also work and not giving up because there was a lot of times I was in certain situations where um, it was mainly male run print shops and it was like, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you know, all these things. And it was like, okay, I'm just gonna stay. And then, you know, by the end, it was like, I would be hired. So it would, it would allow me these kinds of possibilities. And I was like, oh, this is a possibility. I sleep with it. It's so cool to be up there. But uh, I started Duke Press as it means to make enough money to live in New York. Uh, I worked in a lot of print shops and that was really fun and I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed working with artists and learning on the job and messing stuff up and learning from my mistakes. So there was a lot of really good influences that I was. Uh, surrounded by when I moved to New York in 2010 and messed up and I think I had a car. But then I came back and uh, through working in retail and other things I didn't like, you know, I knew that I could work hard and do something that was more interesting and continue my focus. Uh, coming from the Kansas City Art Institute, graduating into a recession similar to now, but then going to Omaha, meeting some really amazing mentors, Brigitte McQueen being a really powerful one for me, uh, introduced me to Wanda Ewing, who was another printmaker. Uh, I just hung around her in her studio, helped organize her collection, and through that, she kind of gave me a lot of like influence, knowing that there isn't anybody out there, but knowing that if you're passionate and have a lot of grit and show up, you know, is really the hardest part. Uh, then you can actually make connections and then get more resources, and all of a sudden, it's a community. So I was in a really good pocket of Omaha, Nebraska uh, during the recession that 
then I transferred here with retail, right? Working in retail. But you know, you get out of that, you make friends, uh, and then all of a sudden you get all these ideas coming at you because there's other people that just have these sparkly things, you notice the sparkly thing about me. And then together we kind of like let that magic happen. But you know, there's a lot of like learning in other places. Uh, so just showing up to different print shops, learning the ropes. Every shop is so different too, so you really have to be um, on your P's and Q's with things organized and operational. So then, you know, starting starting my own business really meant that I just needed more money, right? I didn't have enough, so nobody was mad when I peeked under the press and decided to design my own. Uh, and that has been working for me since 2017. Uh, and now I'm, you know, growing and doing more stuff on my own in my shop and really enjoy building it out to be able to work with this specific artist vision. So it's all kind of coming together in one big nest. Maria, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit struck uh, because I'm like, surprised, and maybe we should do a little uh, history, you know, timeline setting here. So when you were in those shops and having those experiences and hearing like you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you're not you know like man enough, whatever. Uh, this is the nineties. This is the nineties. It was it was the nineties and the two thousand. Yeah. I mean, of course, I also had a great experience. I, mean, I worked with my board and um, in Paris, and was able to learn European painting and photography. But it was always this thing of like. Um, I think also in Paris to printmaking was uh, more of a trade and separated from the way Cameron was, you know, male and female roles that way. And uh, you know, it was like, well, you got pee in the water to get the pH right, and I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, things like that. And then, you know, they're almost like little tests to see how far you'll go. Really? Like, I hate it. Like a gentle print, yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. There's no yes. Oh, wow. So, I'm not a printmaker, I know. I'm sorry, okay. Um, that's really interesting, Judith. Can you take us a little bit inside the early 70s in the training program for you? I was listening to a, a panel or something, I know you've probably done a hundred of these on this topic, and there was a reference to you wearing frilly aprons in the studio. Can you tell them what to set the scene? Were you doing, were you t doing some painting of your own as, as a woman in the world? <laughs> I was making a, a visual statement because I would be on a press <coughs> with a huge roller with a blended inking. <coughs> and, you know, an enormous roller would on a press that was one of those you jump on a, a board and you have to engage the scraper bar and I had this enormous roller and somebody walked by and said, are you the printer? And I thought, well, um, she sees what I'm doing. I'm obviously the printer. So I got myself a Betty Crocker <laughs> So that there'd be no mistake that I was the one who had the roller and I was the printer. And I found that my new York sense of humor um, was very strange in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> and I talked really, really fast and had lots of quick ideas, and they talked quite slowly and went over their options really slowly. And it would drive me crazy. <laughs> and they, <clears throat> um, I, I was, uh, so I was. When I uh, first arrived, there were two very tall, handsome men who joined me at the, um, and they stayed with me for the full two years that I was there, Richard Newland and John Hutchinson. And they were both excellent printers and really good friends. And I think that was one of the, um, uh, you know, having their friendship and having their um, just camaraderie. They did things their way, I did things my way, and my confidence grew because I felt equal with them. Um, although the rest of the print shop it was really it was really hard. Um, you know, there would be a huge press that had to be moved, a uh, two-ton press, and so I'd get behind it and push, and nothing would happen. <laughs> um, but I'd still get behind her, and they believed that I was pushing. Um, <laughs> There were uh, lifts 
forklifts that move these very large, heavy lithography stones. And the issue was, you know, you would get a hernia if you moved one of the stones. Um, you know, but there was a lift. So I, my point of view was, well, just push it on the lift. And, you know, then you can move it. And nobody has to get a hernia. You all, you don't have to demonstrate how tough and how strong you are. You know, be sensible. Use this muscle rather than the physical muscles. And so I just kept my, my Brooklyn sense of humor and just, um, you know, just did the work. And I, what, what was, um, I think a, an eye opener for me is I had, I had actually studied at Pratt Graphic Center at 831 Broadway. And I had a lovely teacher, Jeff Stone. I noticed his last name, Jeff Stone. And uh, he encouraged me to get my first lithography press and a leather roller. And he had certain ways of working, um, which built up confidence in my attitude. And when I got to Tamron, they had all different kinds of ways of working, none of which I felt were cogent. And so I just decided to put a little curtain around myself and just work and get results and, um, and then keep my good humor. Um, a panel that you were on at that Tamron conference in 2019 with uh, a few others, including Deb Cheney, who's here. Hi, Deb. Um, uh, Deb asked you at one point, is your, you know, do you feel that you developed that, you know, that confidence, that toughness as a result of all these difficult experiences, of, you know, early in your career, and you said, no, it's my personality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very obstinate. <laughs> Kathy, does this ring true with any of your experience? Uh, what was it like here in the early 70s and your experience in the shops that you were working in with Bob and others? Anyone who knows Bob Wolfram knows you step off the elevator and you're his best friend. Mm -hmm. He says, get to work and you have work. And then he says, wait, did you say you can type? I need another job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I got fired from the type of job. <laughs> I can't do a horse thing. I don't want to do that second time. Oh, please, please, please type a letter. But within a week, he handed me a plate of Romeo beer to print. I was printing my own work. I had the color all laid out, and he brought me this plate and said, Put some color on this plate. So it was an open door of resistance. I had three, I'm one of three sisters, and we were power broker sisters. We were very good at them. In high school, we were all known um, the dark Irish ladies. <clears throat> we were all very stubborn and strong minded. I didn't even see any masculine resistance. Mm -hmm. Bob never, never, never gave me a clue that he thought I was less than uh, not going to be able to do the job. He totally trusted me and he opened that door in a way that I did not suffer the ignominy of the, the masculine. Macho press that although I did notice I could go to the shop and think, oh, macho press, this is a macho press. You must have certain you know, attitudes, but this is New York culture and you have lots of variety and lots of choices, less of thank you for opening your doors and then you can become the first woman um, a color to, to set up a, a shop is really brilliant. And I thought, really? This is the first. We don't have more of these. I'm somehow ignorant of what's not happening or what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I did get to work with Emma Amos, mm -hmm. and she um, brought me a river girl posters. Mm -hmm. And there was the resistance of, of women shown in museums, and there was one called a report card. We had the Whitney, the, the <coughs> Museum of Modern Art, the Met. Look for the um, and got a report code it was zero, one, two, and zero. It was a ridiculous how many women showed at a one person show at these museums. 35 years later, I opened up the Sunday Times, and there's the Gorilla Girls on step of, steps of the net. And went there, there's this bragging writer on the way he has purchased. Leslie, I saw you nodding, but I also saw you wanting to respond. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, but also take the mic. Tell us a little bit about 
like what did you encounter? <laughs> did you feel like you encountered resistance? You were contemporaries. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just, just, just hate resistance. You know, there's a different direction to go if you just turn around. But so uh, I'm so lovely of like the stage up here, but uh, an assistant of mine is a formal assistant to yours, uh, Claudia. I, I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Uh, but she says wonderful things about you. She's my only employee, right? I finally can have an assistant, and she's Woo! wonderfully trained by you. So that's what I'm like really excited to bring up. Uh, so just because I'm, uh, you know, first black woman doing this doesn't mean that like. Anybody else is going to be able to, unless I can open doors for multiple, you know, people that are doing kind of under the ground stuff. So I was a big fan of the and still like, New York Art Book Fair and the kind of like punk culture that came out of that. Shane Michael King was a really big influence. Um, so he did a lot to uplift people that didn't really have the stage but had interesting ideas. So he was definitely someone that I looked towards when he went. I didn't really know there was a platform, but going there to talk with different artists and publishers that were just helping their friends out because you know, one person has a great idea, one person writes, the other person can be scrappy and put it all together. You know, so I was kind of this scrappy, energetic person, and in any kind of group, that person is always going to be the one to just like make it all happen and then clean everybody's ideas up. Um, but yeah, it's it's exciting to have uh, people say no, right? Because then it gets me to go a different direction. And I think that grit comes with like being able to overcome a lot of adversity. Uh, you know, it's hard to do business. Well, I just want to print. Not print all day long. You know, they're hard. Colors, <laughs> <laughs> really come on. Sunshine out. I end up printing at night because that's the only time I can really focus without having pressure of other things to do. So I end up staying up late and then waking up late and then all of a sudden it's night time again and I get to print, you know. So uh, I'm not. Uh, upset at all. So it's even when there are kind of obstacles, I still ignore them in a way. Uh, but it's been really exciting to grow at this point in history because I do see museums and institutions changing left and right. And it's not something that I even noticed was a problem even. So being a, a woman at, at this time and of age to be able to take part uh, in the revolution feels really exciting. Especially the Met collected a print of mine, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 That being in the museum feels very empowering, and it's not a series I do anymore, but it was the way of giving back and taking my energy and putting it forward. But the problem was that taxes make it so <laughs> such a bad idea for a for profit business. So, you know, there's certain ways you have to just stop, pivot, you know, change directions. But definitely, I'm not, not strong. I mean, I collaborate with people so that together we can do more as a team, but as far as like not being strong enough as a woman, like I'll just push it aside. <laughs> uh, printing alone, you know, I had to have other influences before me and then uh, understand where to get materials from, all these other things, and just collect all the positivity and don't worry about the stuff you don't have. So. Yeah, Leslie, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, the um, Met acquiring the work because it, I feel like your career has really kind of been taking off lately. Um, and the storefront being open now in Bed Stuy. Um, what does this mean for you right now? Are you are you kind of I feel like sometimes we have these moments in our lives where we're aware that we're going through a period of like this is it. <laughs> like not we it's up the top of the mountain, but it's like an inflection point. It's really it's a whole point. Point. Yeah, like what how do you where do you how are you kind of dealing with that right now and how are you how do you feel that your work is being read and, and that you're being seen and received by people now? I'm, yeah, excited to even know who I am. That's weird. <laughs> but it's really cool to be able to be solo about it. You know, I respect what you're talking about, Judith, because it's, uh, you know, you want to just take advantage of people trying to work with you. And so it could be easy to just say, like, I'll do more and more, hire more people, and do all the things. But it's really important for me to pause and do publishing at the same time so that I can get the voices out that I do care to help, them, especially when they do critical work about institutions mm -hmm. and care to deep dive into archives so that those lasting impressions that we do make together can actually be more political than they physically appear. So kind of like diving more into how and why they were made gives you a better 
idea of where the times are that we sit right now. So yeah, I, I resist kind of growing too fast and enjoy the process of putting my studio together. But the, the goal is just to be flexible, you know, so right now I can do one-offs and help painters make prints on paintings and uh, be more versatile as far as like not having to do commercial work. But uh, staying focused on fine art is so that you have to be slow, intentional, archival, uh, use materials, so everything's just invested back into the shop and it feels like a really good flow of energy to continuously like do some cool stuff. But even today, if someone came to pick up a print and asked me about print making, so I couldn't stop and say, like, no, I have to do a panel about print making. <laughs> 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 uh, so it's, yeah, I'll never stop connecting with people now, especially that my doors are open. Yes, uh, on where? Tell us so we so can visit. 19 Fashion Avenue, Doobie Press, right? If you interrupt me while I'm printing, I won't open the door for you. <laughs> so please make an appointment, and I'd love to see. Uh, it would be really great. Uh, I'd love to visit, show me how all that. So, one thing I've heard a little bit about so far, and I've just been curious to pivot for a little more, is uh, uh, you know, printmakers in the audience you know, one thing we talk a lot about here at Print Center is the importance of um, uh, the, the print shop as a community space, right? As a site, not just for artistic production, but also for um, mutual resource exchange, for material support, um, also sites for really like creative and intellectual um, uh, intimacy with other people that you're working with, especially artists you're collaborating with maybe and I'm kind of curious, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with you, um, because I feel like Tim Grand has this kind of like, just like a cool place, like, they're like just cool people. Okay, so, I want to know, like, how do you think, yeah, we did a Nicole Eisman show earlier in the year, and Nicole's worked with um, Marina a lot, along with some other printers in, here in New York, and people were coming to the opening, they might be something in there. <laughs> um, how do you think about your place as um, master printers, as people who run shops, who collaborate with artists and other printers, and like within that kind of ecosystem of, of a community of print people who are maybe sharing resources, learning from each other? Um, yeah, thinking about it, right? <laughs> well, it's funny because I'm on stage with Catherine Graccio, who, when I first came to New York, had didn't know anything, didn't know where I was, literally I was kind of um, on Flushing and Grand Avenue and it was a warehouse area, there was no resources for printmaking anywhere in sight and I somehow got in touch with Cassie, which I don't remember how, and we shared waters, you know, we bought that huge, it was like this huge investment for me and I built my shop over time, so I would do jobs, and then I would invest in materials, and I would do other jobs. And, and some of them were printmaking jobs, and some of them were more like construction jobs, or whatever I could get. But Kathy Croucher and all print shops um, in the area, I've always been able to, since I do have a small shop, use other print shops as a resource. Mm -hmm. um, and also other printmakers to get their brains about how to do things. Um, I'm always trying to figure out different ways of problem solving, and part of that is being able to have these great relationships with printmakers that are up here and other printmakers around them. I don't know if that kind of. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, like, you know, one thing I think maybe to thinking about too, Kathy, so I'm glad I didn't know about this connection, which is great. But I know, Kathy, you have had this apprenticeship program. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Why is that important to you? Why has kind of nurturing the practices and careers of younger artists and other printers been something that's really key for you throughout your career? Um, I want to step aside on the last issue is uh, Judith Salakin and I were at the Blackbird Studio at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I watched Judith be a professional master printer. And I was playing the game of just watching everybody do what they do. Intaglio is quite different than one of them in terms of the playfulness and the range. And, you know, you could be a mama print, you could, you know, make it up as you go. Litho has rules, and one of the things I didn't know how to do was run a business. And I asked her, uh, I can't see myself as a business person. I'm clueless as to, how do I pay myself? What do I do? And she gave me some very good advice. 
um, I joined uh, legal workshops and business opportunities. But I didn't do that for 35 years. She gave me the advice many years ago. Okay. I went to Pat Branstead with me on Aeropress, and she said, what's your bookkeeper look like? And I said, my bookkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> so I hired a bookkeeper who trained me to make books. It was long and yellow. It was green pages, and I taught myself bookkeeping. Anybody who opened the door, I went in. They said yes. I proceeded to follow up my nose and ask, ask, a, ask a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. You can't really hear yourself the way you think you do hear yourself. Can you go back to the question? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'm working, I'm working, with, working with interns. Yeah. Again, I have to say the Black Blackburn Studio was rich with variety of types of people and international um, possibilities. And what I did was I trade off. I started a collection. I watched all the collections. And I, I wanted to own every print that I fell in love with. And I was making art, so I could trade with other arts. And then they'd say, well, what are you doing? And I would say, well, come and give me an hand. And I would say, let me help you with that. You're not doing it that way. I think there's a better way to get to, to the point. So having interns was an exchange of information. And really making it up. It, it wasn't, there was no time in Google for each other. Which, did they teach you to talk it was Crown Press. So. Oh, absolutely. You know, there was certainly a yeah. on the list. Yeah, so yeah. certainly a yeah. um, It wasn't, it wasn't my time. And they had, they did have, oh, no, oh, do we show anything? Wow, this is Tom. <laughs> it, it looked more like sunscreen to me. What happened to the Tom McFall? But it was Captain Brown, God bless, she's really still doing a wonderful job. So you're right. But I didn't, I didn't look up from my my workspace. I just worked. I dropped an idea and I tried to proceed. Um, and met lots of people who were willing to share. And when they retired at the Boston uh, I either hired them or I removed them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it, there's a, you know, maybe it's usury, a lot of internships exchange uh, information for their labor. And that satisfied a lot of people. And then the interns lasted five years. And then they went to grad school. Mm -hmm. So it was um, just a wonderful possibility to adopt new young ideas with people and see what they're what they want to do. Their you know, hard work is is contagious, frankly. Yeah, they bring great energy, but also um, it's like, how else do you learn how it works in a shop? I mean, I'm think I'm listening to to the four of you talk. Not a printmaker, as I said. If I wanted to become one and I wanted to have a shop, like, where do I even, how do I even start? What am I even, yeah, you're making it up, right? Like, how do you learn how to keep your books? How do you figure out your taxes? How do you keep them? <laughs> 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 Leslie doesn't know, still. Uh, Judith, like, how many times did your studio, has your studio, you started in Chelsea? I've had five different studios. And each time I've accumulated a large, heavy presence. And so, um, and I had a gallery uh, for a period of time. So each time, um, it was a major operation to move and uh, build up a future shop, put in electricity, uh, reinforce the floors, make sure the elevator could withstand the load, um, and storage, etc. building. You know, building in and also building equipment that was on casters so that I could relocate to another place. Yeah. Um, presently, I'm up in Riverdale in the Bronx <coughs> um, and have an extremely small shop. And I um, lightened my load considerably. I used to be in the Star Lehigh building right here on West 26th Street. Um, and the rents, every time you look, if you want to find a place to move, speak to me because I moved <laughs> to every location that was affordable for artists and then pressed and then stayed for a while and got priced out. It's kind of the seven year rule. Every seven years I was priced out and had to move again. Um, and hopefully nobody wants to come to Riverdale, please. <laughs> <laughs> But I have an extremely small space, and I've added, I, I keep adding other types of equipment. 
Uh, one thing, I don't know if the other printers here share my enthusiasm for machines. Uh, yes. I love machines. <laughs> and so I have now a whole bunch of sewing machines, which are much easier to uh, place and to work with and don't take a, as much space as a printing press. Um, but one thing I wanted to address, and I hope we have time for it, is we're talking about uh, the female and print. Um, I want to talk about um, aging and print. Please do. And um, I'm finding now, um, I'm getting the same reaction I got when I first started out um, as a woman in the printing environment. Um, you know, I grew up with uh, an electrician, and he would want to find out. He turned to my assistant, Rodney, um, instead of asking me the questions, and I was accustomed to that. And Rodney would say, no, nope, you're going to speak to her. Um, but now when I say that I'm doing a project, uh, everyone assumes that I have a whole bevy of um, staff doing the project. And frankly, it's moi. I'm the one who's doing it. I'm the one who's lifting the roller and sponging the plate or, you know, manipulating the paper in the sewing machine. So, um, you know, you can, well, I worked with, them. I had a period when I was working with um, elder, mostly female artists, and um, they were all, you know, working hard. As well as you know, who just passed, she was a really hard worker. Uh, she kept me going exhausted. Um, you know, June Wayne, uh, Alice Neal, um, Louise Bourgeois, you know, all very vital, active artists, um, and working, working hard and physically working hard. So I don't know what this assumption is that I can't lift up a pencil, <laughs> but uh, it's something to address, I think. Kathy? I'm not getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I took a risk. Uh, are you still printing? Absolutely. See, exactly. But, I, but I've gotten it. It's my fifth studio space and it's 200 square feet. So I put things in storage and it's, I can touch everything in the room from one spot. <laughs> so I, I have simplified and I'm caretaking my collection. So that's my, my other uh, aesthetic hack is uh, I'm creative in the collection uh, sensibility versus I'm making art and I'm always thinking of my next Christmas card. You guys all know that I do Christmas card maker. And it's handmade and I have to kind of do, I love production. I love problem solving. I love getting the room and then it gets sent out and it gets out of it. So as all as this, my brain sounds really good, huh? My body's hanging in there, I'm okay. Why am I almost up? Yes, it Yeah, I mean, I just love the process also. So, production is really where my head is most of the time. And then you have to think about, like, okay, well, if it's going to be in someone's collection and they're somewhat like me and scattery, because you're not very, like, settled, moving shops sucks, right? But moving houses also sucks. Like everyone like moves to New York and then they have to like be away for like a month while your like life is upside down. So uh, I'm still situating my living situation, right? It doesn't have my like, print shop in it anymore. That was a really hard band-aid to rip off. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that I've got a room with a bed in it, right? Mm -hmm. That's not on the couch anymore all the time. But it's a uh, weird to have a place to relax, right? And so the shop is where I can work and I can be very energetic and then my house is where I can relax. And then those two things are separate. But the uh, excitement, you know, of being in the shop and like having this production to work on makes me realize that like, we cater everything to what's already out there, right? Make prints that are the frame size and then do whatever you want inside the page, but make it so the artist can also have some agency within that. So I'll do whatever I can to make sure that the experiments I do on my own work will be reflective to what an artist can do. Shariku Shafaro came to my studio to hand paint his films, and then um, I selected a part that was the most printable that was going to be like formatted in the page with the border you wanted. You know, so it's it's a conversation between us based on the um, limitations of the process. I'm always nodding to lithography, right? We're trying to make our frequencies as smooth as possible and make it so it's hard to see dots, but when you're just using like a matrix that has to be exposed in different formats, 
um, that gives you that smooth texture and beautiful finish. Um, I have to be experimental with myself within a day, within the time that I have. <coughs> this opposite of the client work that's very precise and very deliberate. Uh, so it's it's nice to be experimental in some respect, but also regiment enough to get the job done in a certain amount of time. So I really enjoy being the um, captain of, of both worlds. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah, you really have to build a shop around the limitations that the process is going to put you in the box for. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do new things now that I have space for it. Yeah, I love my space for it. Marina, your space is really work space, right? It is, it is. So it's always working. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's in all of them, probably too. But uh, yeah, working all the time. Yeah. Uh, which I kind of love. I kind of love. I grew up in that kind of environment where you're just always around a studio environment and you can always go in and out and, you know, Dry some prints, go out, uh, have a sandwich, come back in, make tea, you know, all those things. But I'm also curious about um, your publishing ideas as a whole. Um, do you think of all the work that you've been doing, Judith, um, in your archive? And how do you, I'm trying to figure out how I want that to be archived and what I want that to say. Do you think about that? I'm sorry if I'm changing the direction. No, 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 no. I'm very interested in publishing archives, obviously, and I'm just curious about your thoughts on it. I'm presently thinking about this all the time because I have a, to decide on the legacy exactly. and where the work goes. Yeah. And um, I've always had a bullet to read for other the artists I've ever worked with. Um, and, but I also have to sell things to make a living, and um, it, it's a, uh, a struggle. Do I hold on to something of um, you know value that I know will have a market, um, or do I contain it for the uh, archive? Um, and I also, uh, as you all are expressing somewhat, um, this part of, of sitting down and itemizing everything when you'd much rather be making something. Um, so I'm always struggling with that. Um, you know, uh, and keep saying to myself, you must sit down, you must look through these drawers, you must, I have um, a semblance of uh, an inventory, uh, but I used to have lots of staff and they would kind of spot me if I took something out of the wrong place to make a record of it. But now I just take it out and then forget where I put that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, if anyone wants to come and take care of me, I'm very happy to talk to them. I think those are lots of people out there. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a sign up at the end. Uh, if anyone would like to come take care of Judith. It could be an MFA in our archive, archiving, and we can get. Brilliant teachers who can help you and learn. The problem is you have to explain things to them. You're already MFA and you're trying to explain things. Primarily, you have to explain how to hold the sheet of paper. That's what you're Longevity, you know, I'm counting my years, and it is finite, you know. Uh, you have to be realistic. Um, so, what proportion of time do you put into creating new pieces, and what do you, you know, do to mine your uh, history? Um, and also, I'm finding that um, museums are not as um, you know, generous in terms of looking at female archives and female to male, um, which, you know, is sort of a broad statement to make, but it's something that I'm coming up against, um, where it's not taken as seriously. Um, so it's a conundrum. I'm glad you uh, kind of took us there because I think before we open it up for any questions from you all, um, 
I wanted to ask uh, for anyone who feels we don't all have to answer this, but anyone who feels they would like to. Well, you know what? I'll give you two options, and you can pick a thing to answer, and then we'll open it up. So the first question is, let's kind of interrogate the premise here a little bit. It's 2023. 60% um, of, of the um, folks in the Tamron Master Printer training program in the last 20 years are identifying as women and non-binary. Do we still need this panel um, about women printers? Or you can take, how about this one? Um, what have you made something that you tell us something that you haven't um, felt that like you've sacrificed in pursuing your mission? Mm -hmm. You can each pick one and then we'll take any questions from the audience to wrap up. Two tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> what do we need more of and continue increasing access for printmakers? For folks who are just getting started, younger printers who are struggling for that access, who are outside of traditional uh, lanes of access, etc. Um, this is to insult the institutions for having their New York heads up in New York heads. You go to do a research and you realize all the cards in the card file at the, when you go to select artwork to show students. It's four drawers of Jasper Johns, two of them that you see, and there's one in the collection. It's their, 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 it's obscene how they have not witnessed what's going on right in front of them. The institutions of collecting are seemingly deaf, dumb, and blind, and as Judy pointed out, um, stereotypically looking at the, the macho shop as a resource versus. I saw the ladies. I'm sorry, I'm proud of my existence as a contributor. Um, the realization is I have a collection and those are my babies. I didn't have children. What am I doing? Mm -hmm. And realizing mm, nobody cares. They're, they're trying to care. They're talking about their own care. But they're learning to care. They're not yet there. Mm -hmm. And this panel is happy. It should happen every month. Creative <laughs> 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 uh, helps with, with lots of variety. And um, how many people are using the Dusty? So we're crafty. Where are the artists? The artists. Yeah, makers. Yeah. yeah. So it is. It's a confrontation. Of, I've been over here working for a while, but I've been paying attention. I use the museums for study. But I realized that they, they only want the New York name mm -hmm. or the, the, who, who they propagate in this hot. Do you think? Does anybody agree? I agree, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else want to take any of those loaded questions? <laughs> I'm really excited that this is like multi generational because you, you all are having the same struggles. You've gone through this, what I've gone through, uh, what I'm starting to go through at least, and considering your archive and what to do with this um, shift in like uh, caring for objects more than like, I'm not going to have kids, I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not going to happen. But I, I really want to build like relationships that can have like something dropped along the way so that all these like prints can be little memory points, and now that I'm growing and having a Bigger collection, it's really important to put that into a place I can grab that. So, being able to share that and make myself an institution um, makes it a lot easier to grow a community and take all the people that are really excited when they do come over. I'm excited. Uh, put, put all that excitement together, right? And make a new space so that they can start something else on their own, too. But a lot of it has to be uh, shared with being able to just see in person, you know? <laughs> Girls walk past my shop and they'll just peek in. I just wait there for Halloween, you know, I'll get out candy and they see my studio and see that I'm working and uh, that I'm an artist. And so that people just to see it, they can believe it. But if you're uh, understanding it, like to be an artist, you're in a museum and that's how like it's undercover, uh, it doesn't really help with accessibility. So I think being a owner and a maker is really powerful. 
I would say I'm in the same boat. Um, my only thing that I would add is that I think there needs to be more inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, I would say more people of color, more people who don't have access, uh, queer, trans, you know, just more access, expand that to a bigger um, window. I think Bob Blackburn's print shop is a huge idea that should be broadened, I feel like. Places like that are very rare, that are accessible. I have um, students and interns and people who want to be in print shops, but they don't have accessibility to be able to take them. And so they need to be able to go places where they can um, have access. And I think that's the biggest thing. And I love to bring people into work, but then I, then it's a different role for me when you become a teacher. So, um, I think places like Bob Blackburn Shop or Manhattan Graphics, those are incredible places that need to be supported for to allow accessibility to more people to be able to then go out on our own and do more, more things. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I just want to pull you up. <laughs> but it's the same, it's the same like active reproduction. You know what I mean? You're like still producing stuff, but if you have to teach, then it's like, a little bit like less of the fun, right? Um, yeah, but I think, I think, uh, Marina, I'm glad you mentioned that, and I, uh, that's exactly what this question about, um, you know, how we keep increasing that access for this next generation of, of young printmakers who may be master printers in 25 years, 20 years, um, is getting at, right? Like, to, to mention Christine Adams' research again, what she found was that women were trying to get into this program in the early days. And they they were not allowed access to them, right? And so simply having the space that's available to people is the first step. And I think you're right, these organizations you mentioned are really key for that. Um, and maybe we need a few more if anybody needs a hobby and I don't want to put this space in other space. Also supporting the ones that are here it's it's because right now it's always a struggle. Yeah. yeah, because and also like, you know, to your point and Lindsay's point and each of you, you know, you're working independently, you're working solo often. Um you're really pouring your whole kind of it sounds like your whole lives into this work. And uh while you can bring people into those communities and have those like personal relationships with apprentices, interns, people you work with, and students and students. Um, there's only so much that you can do, but a space that creates a wider community and brings more people into working in a communal space in a print shop in rotation, right? And sharing those resources constantly seems like uh, the kind of whole cross around the shop that can kind of like address. I have an objection to that thing. Tell me. And the objection is that we are not always thought of as teachers and um, it's that role to go out and you know, nurture um, and bring up. And if you think of, of a lot of the um, um, shops that are run by men, it's not assumed that they're going to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And so they have the option to be what's called professional mm -hmm. and to go out there and do the you know, big heavy lifting with the galleries and the museums. And there's a, there's a certain amount of not being taken seriously. Right. While you're busy doing the care work. Yes. Okay. And I do teach and I do now enjoy it. Uh, yes, I do. Because I really resented it. I wanted to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the same party. Right. Um, now I'm at a career where I can get a kick out of it. Um, plus I'm going around. Do we have any questions for anyone? Um, yes. I just wanted to put a plug in for a history class. Yes, yes. please. I think we're sure that they're, they're, they're my neighbors. neighbors. Mm -hmm. Huh? They're my neighbors. Oh, so you know that yeah. they're very friendly, mm -hmm. non-binary. Yeah. After the, yeah. I forgot to mention them. Yeah, and they have a waiting list to be members. So I don't know. Oh, yes. She's straight, she straight for us. us. <laughs> She's straight for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For Brooklyn, she's not Yeah. yeah. For not even, I'm repeating it for our friends at home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the waiting list is like for any of the other members. Well, I'm going to try to be more creative because I don't want contamination in my spot. My space is so important to be very pure for me and controlled, especially so that the prints can be a reflection of the space they're made. But then it, the goal for me is to take it on the road, right? 
I got a disclosure unit that's uh, able to be mobile, so I can show up places and have people make up where they are, and then you can do it on the spot, right? So it's it's that's another accessibility issue, an inclusion issue. If you can't make it to the space and you can't show up and be part of it, if I just go to a park with all my equipment, get a cord and some guys right plug in the exposure unit, you be good to go. That's cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, speak loud. Okay. Um, first of all, I was obsessed with Kathy's term modules. I don't know if you incorporated that in that category. Uh, yeah. I have a juice of the Ethan story that we have because I met Leslie and I thought I would bring this up to modules. It is three men. Leslie was sort of a comedian. All of life, like, always has like, great passion. Immediately, it's like a good person to find out. Like, super comfortable, and you need to see someone like, like, a safe man. Uh, you know, to kind of talk to. And so I feel like we're talking about like fun, weird things. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First time. <laughs> it's it's something we just can't do. Yes. Yes. Um, I love the term macho shop. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good story uh, about the trainer who I hated with me. And so when I was like, you have to do a macho shop. And um, the way Leslie, Leslie is a sense, sense of fashion, and immediately it's a new, but that I mean is a progressive color, it is safe. And so I think as like um, queer trans people of color, the way that our appearances, the way we dress ourselves is kind of sort of inherently politicized, we can have this luxury of not making consideration of how we present when we go out. And so I guess I wonder in your own experience, like both working in the field, you know, like having your own practices, like how has you know, how has considerations of like how you're presenting to your coworkers, to your the people you're bringing you, uh bringing into the shop thing. I think the shop thing, I don't care about the dress. To their change. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? Any other? I haven't dressed that in a while, so my outfits are always based on what I haven't said in the movie. You give me things, you know, like it's just, it's, I'm a, a collection of other people's stuff that they think is going to be cool. You're a very exciting person, Vincent. It was so good to have you there because it was otherwise like suffocating to be around some macho energy. Uh, but you know, it's about just showing up as you are and forcing people to be okay with that. You know, if you can do the work, then that speaks for itself. Um, what you look like doesn't matter. You know, at the end of the day, it's more about attitude and quality. And quality. Like the outfits in the show culture. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you want to wear them yourself? I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of approaching the problem. It's the opposite. <laughs> any other questions or comments from any other pictures? Yeah, let me give you this mic. Right. Oh, I love most of everyone here on stage. And um, I'm a printmaker, I'm a film as well. And I was born as a printmaker, and I don't know what that is, but I'm very proud of this. And the artist, the little curator at the Bronx Museum, and she created this uh, print shop that's called the Bronx Printmakers. And that's how I got turned down into a printmaker. So, we help artists who open up the doors to uh, a bring up the community to create our friends and turn up the friends. And then we made like two, she brought us down to the library, but we created two um, portfolios with that, it was great and expanded, you know, the learning and everything. So I just wanted to share that as part of this conversation. Thanks, Moses. Moses, right? Yes. Right. yes. I wanted to put a, a note about uh, Una Johnson at the Brooklyn Museum, a curator, um, who uh, was at the Blackbird Studio. A group of people were running out the door to be able to get a last chance to present 
a portfolio of four reviews to do a show every two years. And I got into that show with a great print I just pulled up the press, said, where's every where's everybody going? Stuck the web print in the portfolio of the guys who the book and Then you do that. That's that's one person in my life. Roberta Rodeo, who was second to be my shirt, and God bless her, because she was intelligent and smart and kind and could give you, she looked at your work and said, um, this reminds me of, and she pulled out prints and showed you some parallel uh, older work, and then she pushed you toward looking at more work in your field. Um, two women that have to do with that kind of too. Mentioned the effort that women had to go through to enter the art world, mm-hmm. and they found the doors closed. So they accessed the print world, had a little sliver that they could move through, and they excelled. Um, I just saw Mark show at the um, uh, Art Dealers Association, Sue Fuller, um, who had these beautiful string drawings and tiny little etchings. And so, the, you know, textiles was another area, but, um, and the albums. Um, you know, women will excel when there's an opening, when there's a, a possibility. And the history has been that it's been primarily shut to them. This is Chrissy Lowe's book um, on women printing in 2017 um, in the New York uh, this year. Um, it's an amazing book. But I want to add a uh, little description of the book, which will apply to Stanley Hayter. And it was his huge eye looking at her. And basically, what she was saying was, because <laughs> they relegated uh, uh, women to the top floor. Um, and uh, later in, in Paris, um, concentrated on the more established male artists. That was a different time, probably. But, you know, that's what I think it might be for them to keep the celebrators back. Well, on that note, Judith, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight to think about the work and the legacies of the many, many women. Uh, who have broken barriers uh, in the industry for maybe publishing. Um, uh, a model workshop, which you're in now, is on view until December 23rd, and there's a fantastic um, catalog in the lobby, um, so please do check that out. Um, we have a couple more programs in conjunction with the exhibition before it closes. The next one is next Saturday. Um, Master of the Volunteer Deb Cheney is going to be here. <laughs> She's going to take us inside the liquid market process and uh, and look at some of the work on view, and then we'll do a screening of a 1955 instructional film about the poverty, which usually projects on that wall right behind you, and it's fantastic. So please come back and join us. There's a little flyer in the front at the desk with public program information, and you can also find that online. Um, thank you again, Kathy, Judith, uh, Marina, and Thank you to my colleagues Aaron and Alexa for their hard work setting up tonight's event and Emma for coordinating with it.